That might be nice if they would do so. Oh, we're ready to start. Of course, naturally, this means it won't happen. But, uh, yeah. Okay, Elliot's going to come on here and give a presentation. <laughs> now, I got a couple of short presentations. The first one I'm going to make is on application containers, which aren't really containers. Uh, one is, but two aren't. So I'm going to look at applicate in, in very very <coughs> general sense. I'll look at Snap, Flatpak, and AppImage. AppImage, by the way, is actually used to install uh, Photox. And I'll try to provide some information as to what they are and why they may be needed or in some opinions useless. And again, the issue really is Linux is an anarchy. A lot of companies are trying to manage that space. Uh, my job at Red Hat was part of that, where how do you take a big distribution and make sure that everything compiles and runs in that distribution? And that's kind of hard. And they're trying to write code around that. I can't say too much more about that. Um, and again, we have dozens of distributions. We even have several distributions for uh, visually impaired people. We've seen one here, on the presentation here. Um, and so every thing releases on a different schedule. Uh, for instance, Ubuntu releases every six months on their schedule in October and in April. Fedora releases approximately every six months, but they don't, they don't release based on a date. They shoot for that date, and if there are any really bad bugs, they'll keep delaying until they fix the bugs. It's a difference, it's an older way of doing it. There are justifications for both. And there are other distributions, but you also you have not only distributions, but you have all the products underneath the kernel. They have their own distributions. Then you have updates, and it it gets very difficult sometimes, especially if you're trying to put these things together and keep updates going. So why do we need yet another packaging system? Uh, consider that you have, you're a developer, you have an application you want to run on most Linux distributions. Well, on Ubuntu, you're going to need some pieces uh, that are you know, normally installed with Ubuntu, but some pieces that aren't. On Fedora, you're going to use, there are going to be some pieces you need, but that aren't installed normally. And while Package managers like RPM and uh, Debian, or Deselect, which is really a double in Debian. Depackage. Depackage. Eight after aptitude or more. No, those are not package managers. DPKG is the package manager. DPKG, you're, you're correct. But in any case, you've got two different package managers, and they generally uh, set up. Uh, um, of dependencies, and just sometimes there's a conflict between applications and dependencies and stuff like that. So let's take a package manager for an application that is set up for the application. It has all the pieces that it needs except the pieces it knows is going to be in the distribution. It knows the kernel is going to be there. It knows Live C is probably going to be pretty standard. So it makes that assumption. But it, otherwise, it packages almost everything you need to run that application. 
And then you download that package to your Fedora or your Ubuntu or your Arch Linux or whatever distribution you're using, and it probably is going to work. And that's the reason for these, because it's been so crazy. Okay. So, what is a container? What is an application container? Now, in this context, it's not really a container like a Docker container. I want to make that distinction a little bit. First, you know, I said that App Image and Flatpak don't like to use the term container uh, because they are somewhat different. Um, both of these tend to be, they're more package managers. And they tend to package, as I said, most all of the services the application needs. Um, and it's up to the developer to put these things together. Uh, one of the downsides of that I didn't mention in my slides is that these app images or flat packs are going to be pretty much larger and you might have a lot of duplication on them. But that's a so what these days. Okay, so the, so the developer builds the application into a snap or a, a sandbox. The resulting package, again, is not dependent on separately installed libraries. As I said just a minute or so ago, they'll include most of the dependencies, especially ones that actually might change over time on a distribution. They'll package those in their system. And then the application runs in a secure virtual environment. Uh, App Image and Flatpak actually don't run as a VM. But I have not installed either of them, so I can't say I was going to, I just didn't have time. Snappy's a little different. Uh, Snappy is really was developed by people at Ubuntu for their applications. It essentially solves the same thing, but Snappy actually, you have to have a daemon running called uh, SnapD. That's normally set up through uh, systemd. And a snap image, generally, a snap package actually runs essentially as a true container. And it's uh, similar to Docker. And again, it's uh, it tends to run more in a virtual environment. I, I tend to like that approach better than the other two. Um, I know that Mike, uh, the developer of Photox, doesn't like Flatpak and he doesn't like Snappy. So I, I think the kind of, containerization, I think, is a better approach, in my opinion. You're running, if you're in a container, you're in a virtual, essentially a virtual machine, for all intents and purposes, and you're isolated from the rest of the world. And most of our systems run multiple things. Uh, of course, remember that Ubuntu is king of the cloud these days. And a lot of the clouds run a lot of Ubuntu. Wait, so I don't understand. So if Snap's run, Snappy is running a daemon, does it, in a Snap package, does it also include all the libraries? It should, yes. So what's, why run a separate, what's the point of running a separate daemon? I, that I can't answer. I, I have some URLs. I'll, I, I have the architecture page. I'll bring that up in the next slide. Oh no, that's that's from X window. Sorry about that. Um, they, 
in their on their home page they have a nice little diagram of how how it runs and I did not bring that because I'm trying to make these two presentations pretty short but uh, it is it is runs as a con container and it runs managed by the snap daemon and again you're going to have some duplication in there but again you're just, in, in a container you kind of have to, you're, you're kind of isolated from other applications running and remember when an application runs it loads the libraries it needs and what if on a, right, a non-packaged system you're running let's say one application but the other application needs a different version of the same library so it loads those into a virtual memory in, and it, it can get kind of messy so putting it in a container tends to solve that problem and comes with its own problems takes up more memory takes up more storage no. but those are low cost these days <laughs> and here's some uh, URLs uh, the Snappy website is uh, snapcraft.io and uh, app images on GitHub. And I don't know what happened to my flat pack because uh, I did this on a different computer. I did this on my home computer. And I much, might not have saved it with that last uh, URL for flat pack. But all you need to do, it's on GitHub. All you need to do is type in flat pack and it should come up. Although now, although now GitHub is evil because Microsoft owns them. Ah! <laughs> so there's GitLab. What? There's uh, GitLab. Hmm. The, there's alternatives to GitLab. Yep, yep, yep. And, and <coughs> Git itself, all you have to do is Git pull, Git push, and suddenly you're duplicated wherever the hell you want to be. I wouldn't panic until they well, it's obvious they turned LinkedIn anymore. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I wouldn't either. It's a non-issue. It didn't record. I don't think I pressed the button. I'll do the next one. I'll, I'll give you the slides anyway. So let me bring up the next one here. This is Wayland versus X. Do you want to press record before you start? Yep, thank you. Okay, now we're recording. Okay, um, <clears throat> okay Linux has used the X window system since the very, very beginning of Linux. Um, back since, uh, I think, 94 time frame. But the X window system got its start as X11 back in the 1980s. And there's a reason it's called 11. Okay, what is that reason? It's the 11th version of X. Okay. So, and all those X's from it, it, it goes way back. Actually, it's X11 R6, so it's... That is correct. Yeah. But they they, they, they stopped that. incrementing the 11 and started incrementing the R. And the first time I used it was X10. I'm not sure anybody used anything before X10 outside MIT. I actually work at Cadmus and we had very, very early version of X on our system. Didn't work very good, but it, they were just working on it. It's actually, they sold it, I think, to um, Apple. 
anyway. And number of security flaws. Any kind, any time old software sits around, it gets patched, fixed, changed. The people that designed it certainly can't foresee that far in the future. You know, they watch Star Trek. Oh, this is going to happen in the future. But just things like GNOME and like everything else, they get full of patches and difficult to maintain. Does not work with our fast hardware that good anymore. So they came up with Wayland. And I happen to live in Wayland. <laughs> and as we talked, Dick knows the story because that's a story he presented. A lot of projects are named after some towns around Massachusetts, including Wayland. And Wayland is a replacement for XORG, and of course there was a split in X. Uh, I'm not going to go into that split from years ago and stuff like that. But Wayland was designed from scratch, and it's more of a secure protocol server. And there are a lot of documents out there. I have, I think I've got all the links on here that you really need. Anyway, my first experience with Wayland was when I was at Red Hat. I put, I was going to put Fedora 26 on my laptop, and we have. Once a week, we have a meeting with our group down in Raleigh and Seattle. And we all share our desktops through a system called BlueJeans. And I knew before I put Fedora 26 on my laptop that BlueJeans, while well, BlueJeans worked, it would not share a desktop under Wayland. So, but I still put Fedora 26, and so I go ahead and when I went to the meeting, I go ahead and log in to uh, X. And on both Fedora and on Ubuntu, you can do that. And here's how. If you look up here on the sign in, to the left of the sign-in, you have a gear. Now, this is a fedora. And you have top, that's GNOME, that will be X. I mean, that will be Wayland. And then you have GNOME Classic. And then on the bottom, you have GNOME on XORG. On Ubuntu, it's 18.04, it's reversed. 18.04, the default is Ubuntu on X. It just says Ubuntu. and then. The next line is Ubuntu on Wayland. That's because 17.10 was kind of a failure for them. A lot of things crashed. A lot of things didn't work very well. And a lot of developers were, were better with uh, X, so it went back to X. And X has been around a long time, so there's a lot of code that goes through that. But Wayland's a much cleaner, much, much cleaner. I'm going to show you a couple of diagrams here. Okay, this is the, this is not the, this is the Wayland architecture right here. But if we go, we look down here, oh, I'm sorry, this is the X and you have your clients, they go through the X server, then uh, they go to the compositor, then they go down to the kernel, essential. And of course, Wayland, the Wayland client, always goes directly to the Wayland compositor and then down to the kernel. Um, a lot of the hardware not a lot, but some of the hardware systems um, need to be updated for Wayland. That's why Wayland's taking a little bit of a long time. Because remember, some of the 
drivers for things like NVIDIA and stuff like that are proprietary. <laughs> and some pros for X. X is very network aware. Uh, you, you can uh, easily log into my laptop and run on my laptop just as if it's a local server. And yeah, not to mention, uh, because it existed in the early days, X forwarding over SSH. I'm pretty sure there's other things that you can forward X over. That is correct. Because it was network aware from the start. It was assumed the client was somewhere else, and it works for them. It has some nice uses. When you want that, it's a feature. When you don't want it, it's a security problem. <laughs> That's also true, Mr. Yeah. Security Guy. So, again, I kept this short. I, first of all, I could go and get very, very technical if I wanted to on these things. And I know that I've got some people that want the technical stuff and some people that eyes glaze over. It seems to be the non-technical people, the technical people seem to be this side of the room. And more of the non-technical people were over there, with a couple of exceptions. Anyway, Wayland's not there yet. Fedora fully supports Wayland as a default, as does Ubuntu 17.10, which I mentioned, but 18.04 defaults to X, with Wayland as an option similar to Fedora, like I showed you in the screenshot. Okay, and here are some of the links. Ask Ubuntu why Wayland is better. Ubuntu seemed to like Wayland. There's a link to the Wayland architecture I showed you if you want to get more technical. And there's some, I thought that the, this uh, micro URL there is, uh, tends to have some, answer some questions. So eventually do you expect everything to move to Wayland when they I work. think so. But right now you're basically saying Ubuntu has decided, or Canonical has decided it's not quite ready for prime time. Yeah, they made a mistake. May I just comment? I, I am using Ubuntu 18.04 with Wayland and GNOME. Yep. And while it's a royal pain to have to I reconfigure everything, <coughs> once it is reconfigured I find it's quite stable. Yeah, for most things. Well, <laughs> some of the shell extensions don't work. My my experience with Wayland, I uh, I use Wayland on the door. There are some shell extensions that don't work, but um, not the ones that I consider important anyway. Um, it is going the Linux of the future. You know, system D was also mandated on us, and it's now working fine. I don't I haven't seen any major, major revolutions about system D. Most distributions now are using it, very few that don't. And one other observation about using the Wayland GNOME desktop environment. Yeah. I do have to get used to or change to a shell extension. All icons are used how you run binaries, especially if you're running any binaries as root. Permissions are tighter. And Nautilus no longer includes the items. Yeah, well, one thing I did find, as I was switching between X and Wayland quite a bit on Fedora 26, and I found that it seemed to be a little bit sharper on Wayland than it did on X. You mean the graphics appear The sharp. graphics appeared a little bit sharper. Yes. On my Core i5 with the 
Yeah. Uh, with some fairly up-to-date Intel graphics. Things are sharper, but GNOME is a more Spartan interface anyway to begin with, so hard to tell. Yeah. Okay, Dick, you want to go? Yes, um, I'd like a little help. I want to go online and then set that up ahead of time. Okay. Is the password needed here? No, no password. Nothing more. Oh, I mean, I MIT guess comes right on. No, you want MIT, MIT you want MIT guess. That or it doesn't Same. require password. The obvious isn't obvious. Yes. Um, where am I? Yeah, neither Let's has see. password anymore. Oh. MIT used to be here on the what was the password kept leaking out and getting posted on? No, they got sick of registering every damn phone and every damn phone. Oh, it's a different thing. Uh, they were doing MAC address. Let me go ahead and press the button here. Okay, we're getting there. Oh, I got this one there. Okay, go up to your uh, network. Um, although I, your your mention of permissions being a bit tighter, yeah. um, I I kind of wonder if that might be more of I mean ha, has the current uh, Ubuntu or yeah. Fedora de started yeah. deploying yeah. SE yeah. Linux yeah. and that's not an effect of well, Wayland, no, but, but merely yeah. they've been able to tighten things down more yeah. over the whole system and this also helps. Well, <coughs> let's put it this way. If you want to do PK exec yes. on Wayland GNOME yeah. in Ubuntu 1804, you have to create a policy kit uh, in the description for each application. Mm -hmm. Listen to me. Uh, you didn't have to do that in your click on uh, my X. So click on your it's on, on the exact same like version of oh, the network distribution. Icon right here. What? Click on, on the exact same version of the distribution. You have the same 1804 and it's Wayland versus X. No, you click on the right mm. one. I, it's especially Wayland versus X if you're using no. But Wayland is where the security is heading up. So, okay. And also, again, this is problem, that's saying. the problem of running This is a much faster Wi Fi yeah. than you're using. Oh. I, hey, Jerry, you press the record button. The problem of the icons was the people it's developing. I pressed it as soon as he got the video. No, but it was Wayland. I decided Nautilus should not be handling icons, but this should be handled by the shell in the operating system. Yeah. Hmm. And I think that was known that we did that. So now it's part of the known shell. Hmm. How's that? And it sure did trip me up, both of those. <laughs> Are we ready? Okay. Hi. I'm Dick Myler. I read it up there. Most of the time, <laughs> most of the time I'm Dick Miller. And uh, my wife, Jill, is with me. Uh, we run M Miller Microcomputer Services and have for a long time. And uh, we started when we had separate jobs. And uh, Apple II and original IBM PC came out. and. Suddenly, computers looked like they could afford to come to very small in-home companies and to homes themselves. Big change going on, and we decided to catch it. We had a good time with Windows. For, we had a good time with DOS, and an okay time with Windows for a long time. Uh, but we knew we wanted something different. We didn't know what it was. And we played with some early versions of Linux. We had a lot of small client customers and for our small client customers, they wanted something smooth. Smoother than Windows. Smooth as Mac was back when it was smoother than Windows. And we looked at Linux, and it was very, very crude from that user standpoint. It was doing better things anyway, but it was not smooth. And we wanted to offer smooth. We still feel the same way. We're now deeply into Linux. We worked with it for years before we dared sick it on any of our customers. And uh, now we recommend it. We say, you know, it's really about time you got off Windows. We can help you a lot better if we're on something better. And by the way, it's free. 
And by the way, everything else that comes with it is pretty much free too, except for the time we take to help you as much as you want to either have us do it or have us teach you how to do it. And some go each way. Uh, so we've been very happy, especially when Ubuntu first arrived. It looked like it was going to do the Apple smooth trick for Linux. And for the most part, it did. We have regular debates. And a lot of you will say, I prefer something else. And more recently, Ubuntu preferred something else. It has spent years refining the Unity interface. We really liked it. And poof, a year ago it disappeared on us. And we were supposed to switch over to GNOME. A kind of a shoddy version of GNOME from our standpoint, because GNOME wasn't that smooth for what we wanted, although it may be better for what you want. We understand the difference. But worse than that, GNOME uh, Ubuntu wasn't quite in here either. We used to have a Ubuntu office in Boston. Some of you may have had talks here from Mike Terry, uh, a few other people. Uh, disappeared. By the time GNOME arrived on Ubuntu, um, we were hit kind of sideways. We weren't anticipating we'd have to go to it. And a lot of things had stopped working under GNOME. A lot of things that worked under GNOME, and worked for me under GNOME, and worked for you under GNOME, just weren't intuitive to the kind of users we want to be catering to solving that issue, not creating it. Uh, and without Mike Terry to talk to, I contacted Will Cook. At Ubuntu in the UK headquarters, uh, Will Cook is in charge of desktop software development. He's the guy in the middle on that crunch, and it was a crunch. He said so too. He said, well, we made a good decision to move to GNOME, but bad timing on how long it would take to get our stuff running smoothly under GNOME. And we're limping and you're limping, and what can we do about the particular issues? It wasn't my imagination. A lot of other people have been telling me the same thing. Not the developers. So, a uh, big split between perceptions there. Will and we have been talking. He solved some of our problems instantly. Nice guy. I'm grateful. He's grateful for good feedback when it's useful feedback for where he is. And uh, we still have some remaining problems anyway. My solution was simple. Thanks to that totally fractured Linux community, there were a whole bunch of developers who said, what? Unity 7 is great, Unity 8 was going to be even greater. If they won't do it, we'll do it. It's open source. And we have teams continuing uh, Unity 7, which we are using, and I'll be using it tonight, especially if I press the button. And, oh, come on, did I have that set that short? You apparently did have it. It looked like going <coughs> really good. And, there we go. And um, so... Hey, Trey, can you check that the recording is working? So, uh, very simply, uh, we're still on Unity. It's the launcher down on the left side. That's the tr traditional corner for it. Uh, it's the top bar. And it's nothing else. In terms of regular usage, that's it. It's very slick. It's very smooth. I run it on the left side because on a widescreen display, I'd rather give up a column than a line yep. to the other work I'm doing. Uh, most things I can do will full screen anyway when I ask them to, but I'm in this mode half the time, and I want more on a little computer. So uh, that's the way I run it. I think things are big enough so you can follow me. And um, for people who don't use it, I can slide in anywhere I want on this screen, and it will open for me. It will scroll. I can pick an icon up and move it to a different place. It's all very smooth, much smoother than it is in GNOME. Most of you don't give a damn. It's not what you're doing most of the time. 
but uh, for what we do and for what we offer, it's important. I run one thing religiously. I try to get my users to run it because I want them to talk to me on the phone and tell me what I want to know. Up on the top, I have four little boxes. They are all a part of system load indicator. Oh yeah. And system load indicator is letting me look into the brains and see what's going on inside as it's going. Each of those boxes is a tiny strip chart recorder. It's running in time, real time. And the first one on the left, I'm on the one on the right with the cursor. The one on the left is giving me a run on the CPU activity. I've got four <coughs> cores and four threads on my CPU. This is an El Cheapo computer. I emphasize that to everyone that doesn't know about Linux. It runs a lot better under Linux. I'm running it pretty fancy. But it's the kind of computer that goes on sale for $300. I bought it a few years ago, and that included four gigs of RAM. This year, it's apt to include eight gigs. But two years ago, for $50, you got the other, you got an eight gig chip instead. So I've got eight gigs in it. I'm cheating. The uh, CPU can Intel Pentium. Not that much, but real nice on holding battery charge for a long time. Uh, so for a portable, a nice thing to know that it will work that well. It's got four cores, and it keeps up pretty much with an Intel i3, give or take. They each have an edge on the other on a few operations. It's pretty good. They got a lot better than they used to be for the Pentiums. Uh, and the, so that's my CPU reading, and it's reading all four cores. How do I tell which is which? I color code in a way that makes me remember it. The older I get, the more I want good mnemonics. And simply, one, two, three, four is red, white, blue, and green for the last one. Easy to remember, red, white, and blue is built into us. Works in France, too. England, all kinds of places. Uh, so uh, that's what I do for that. The second one is watching my memory. Down at the bottom, the darker green is active memory in use. I've been running this for a while since I rebooted, and just about all the rest of the memory is cache memory. It's in use if I want to bring something back and come back faster, but it's not needed. Anytime I need more, I can just drop some of it, and I'll just go look for it again later. So uh, I'm not using much of my memory, what, maybe a quarter, a third, maybe, of my memory is in use. Uh, and I'm running a bunch of other programs right now, by the way. Four gigs is plenty for running any program I run, including Photox, which is pretty tricky. Uh, works anyway. If I want to run a lot of programs, 8 gigs is nicer. I'm not playing with uh, running out the disk. Oh yeah, and my disk, for $100 extra, I swapped my 500 gig hard drive for a 500 gig SSD. 100 is cheap for a lot of extra speed. The catch is, it's extra speed when I'm loading or saving. It's not extra speed while I'm running. It's not significant for most people who are running in one program most of the time. Not a big deal, but it's $100. I put it in and I learned what the difference is. And the answer is I really don't recommend it to most of my clients. Where it fits, fine. If they have 100 and we're fitting up a computer anyway, it's cheaper to put it in when we've got the computer at our end. Uh, but the trade-offs get interesting. So it's not an expensive computer. Uh, it runs fast, except it was running slow when I hooked up here. I'll see what that's about as we proceed. Hopefully it'll catch up. Uh, this is network operations. Oh, by the way, the cache is all in greens. The uh, network, just red and white, mnemonic, green and white, red and white. Easy? Same for the storage. Red and white, green and white. I keep it simple. I want to explain it to people so they can explain it back. Uh, and uh, did I miss anything? No, network and storage, I'm done. I can add a few more, uh, but those are the only ones I find really important. And 50% of the time, that little tool up there lets me diagnose 
a nasty problem a hell of a lot faster just because someone on the phone could converse with me about it once it's set up. It didn't work under no. How? Right in the middle of where I'm sitting. Maybe not where you're sitting, but I wanted Unity where it runs fine. They couldn't fix it for me under GNOME. They say that's one of the ones we're working on. Um, so, so much for that. Um, I think I've told you all the things I want to tell you about the background things we'd already been talking about, except for one. Uh, when you want to go get Photox and load it and use it, you'll find out there's a few flavors you can get. The good old .deb file is available, and uh, that you have to match to your version of Ubuntu or your version of Fedora or what have you. And uh, app image is kind of big and fat. I talked with Mike Cornelison, who's the developer of Photox. By the way, Photox, I think most of you heard this earlier, with two X's at the end, F-O-T-O-X-X. We just discovered there's a fly-by-night Photox with one X, and uh, Mike is taking steps to see how to bring it under some sort of coordination. Like, give it a different name, for God's sakes, <laughs> uh, to start. And if it is his code, to stop making it proprietary code that the guy built on, because it's done under standard FOSS licensing. A good copy left. So, um, that will be interesting, just developing. I was the lucky guy who reported it to him as a problem. I'm waiting to hear more. Uh, on this small computer, small as in inexpensive and relatively weak, I will load Photox. And um, when Photox starts, hello. My red cursor was hiding on something red, maybe. Here we are. Uh, I have a confession to make. We had Chinese food for dinner and came here in a hurry. I hope I don't have too much Chinese food on the touch screen. We'll see. <laughs> um, these are experiments to run. I'm about to hit Photox. When I hit it, it will look in my computer, which does have that solid state drive, so it'll be quick on read time. But it's pretty quick anyway. And um, it will look through approximately 43,000 original images, which are sizable, and approximately 2,300 of my edited images, which are sitting in what is called an album, a subset of all the pictures. And they're ones I've selected as being ones I like a lot. I'll explain how I select later. But the point is, it's going to quick riffle through all the 43,000, more accurately a table listing of them, not looking at the images. And it's going to see if any of them do not yet have a uh, thumb, uh, a thumbnail image, a small image that can go into a gallery, a list of a lot of images on the screen. It has to make them if it doesn't find them. And it can make many, many, many per second so it won't take long anyway. And that's the point. You're going to now watch the response time on this computer as I do one, two, three, whack. I've started loading it. And oh, I'm cheating. It was loaded. Let me close it. You know what? I want to take the time for other things. It comes up very quickly. It comes up in probably four seconds, including all the parsing time. Uh, I'm somewhere deep in it right now. and. Uh, let me instead hit a G and go to a gallery view. Gallery views can be basically any size you want, including down to where it shows individual lines with metadata, or it starts coming up to larger sizes until you've seen about full size. Well, I think I'll sit here for today, for the moment. And I am looking into, I think at the moment, my Dick's favorites, maybe. Yeah. Okay, uh, no, I'm looking into one year. Okay, I'll go, I will power down. It's as quick as any way to get there, and you'll get the startup time. Here we are, my mark is set, go. It's loading, 
It's counting noses, 43,642. It only needed one thumbnail, though. Bang, it's up. Very quick, easy to go. Uh, a lot of work going on, but very nice programming inside for efficiency. Um, and um, now we're back in my Dick's Favorites files, <coughs> just mine. I will show you what I can select when I make one. But first I want to mention overview. For those of you who do photography, there's basically three stages in photography. One is figuring out when you want to snap the shutter. For me, that's easy. I snap it a lot. I have a pocket camera. It's not that fancy. And uh, it's with me all the time. That's the big trade-off for me. And I just snap and snap and snap. Uh, and I throw out two-thirds of them early on because I got better ones in the same picture. Uh, but my sister-in-law thinks about it, goes out every morning, and takes one <coughs> photograph. She goes from the other direction. Beautiful photographs. Very well planned out. So the snap might be a very significant piece of the process, or not. Um, the camera. Everybody likes to talk about $2,000 and up lenses for their single lens reflex, which isn't in their pocket when they want to take the picture. I take the other route. They say, oh, but I've got 14 color bits and you've got eight with your JPEGs. Mike Cornelison backs me up on this one. He says, no. Technically, you've got 14 color bits, but after noise goes through, you'll probably end up with 10. You'll be very lucky when you can suck out 12 color bits of bits of color depth. And uh, my eight, I've got tools that will boost me to an effective 10. We'll look at them. What do you know? They tied most of the time. Not all the time, but most of the time. My pocket camera with Photox can actually boost the reasons you want more color depth. We'll look at it. Just the argument. Next bit of information, once you've got the pictures, you want to whittle them down. And you want to make them better. Almost every picture wants to be improved by the software. You can be real good and you can have a real good camera. You still want to probably improve with the software. The exception is some cameras that have that software in the camera. That's beginning to happen now. And there are trade-offs. But in general, you're going to do work on what you bring home. Finally, I want to add that there's photography that goes way beyond improving the photograph. It goes toward the abstract. It goes towards art where the camera didn't get you, but the camera gave you the raw material for going there. Well, look at all of them. Later, you're going to want to manage your photos. You're going to want to find the darn one you had in that 43,000 that are in here. Uh, and pick ones you want to work on, pick ones you want to show. Show a slideshow by putting together a little album where you click, 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 create an album, give it a name, you can now conjure it up, and if you want, you can run it as an automatic slideshow with fancy transitions, whirls around, slides, blurs out, whatever. Uh, Photox does all the above. You already know it was free. Uh, plus, uh, Photox is only available in Linux. Not talking about that other one now. Uh, so that's what you got. Uh, Photox used to come out once a month. Photox now comes out twice a year. It comes out a few months after Ubuntu comes out. Ubuntu is one of the main flavors it worries about because so many people use it. And if that comes out on a schedule, you already know you'd like to come out a little later than that on your developer schedule for something that's riding on it. It runs on the other Linuxes, as far as I know, without exception, but I hardly know all the versions of Linux. Certainly Fedora and the other main Debian versions, etc. it's going to run on those. 
Um, he said the app images. Question? Were, he said the app image had worked on the few other Linuxes he tried it on. The app image is Mike's new favorite, Mike Cornelison, and he says it's awfully big. He doesn't like that. But it carries all the baggage you need, so you'll have a smooth install from the same app image. Whether you have a new Ubuntu, or an older Ubuntu, a new Fedora, or an older Fedora, and as far as he can tell, as far as feedback comes in, it's doing fine on the other likely versions as well. So, his argument is my argument for smooth delivery to more people who aren't sophisticated. The app image is what he finds, what gives him the least grief. The people giving him feedback, where, where do you do this, how do you do that, what am I missing, et cetera, et cetera. It's all in one bundle. You don't even have to find the right one, other than the right version of, of Photox. So, if you want Photox, you can get a .deb version. You can get equivalent versions for other flavors. Um, but I no longer recommend that. I recommend you look way down to the bottom of the page. What page? Well, let's go find me a Firefox. There's one now. And uh, in it, oops, in it. I will say Photox, which won't get me there directly. But what it will do is get me some choices. And the first one is a comment about it. A few other places are carrying it. I'll go direct to the source. And here it is. It's Cornelix with a K at the beginning and an X at the end. Cornelix. Mike Cornelison, but encoded a little bit. He spells it with a C. This is spelled with a K. And that's it. It comes up fast enough. And if you go there, Tunk a tunk a tunk. Pretty fast. Um, if you go there, you'll find a little hello about it. A lot of good info, short overview, very impressive if you want to stop and read it. And then right under that, downloads. Under downloads, click on downloads. If you're having trouble with it, he's got other things you can look at. But uh, start with plain downloads. It's got enough choices itself. Here's tar files. There's all kinds of ways to play with this. Mike's a good programmer. That's not good news for my clients. <laughs> they want someone in the middle. Uh, and uh, all the information you need for that. But alternatively, just keep going down. And you'll come to Debian packages. And now you've got to find the Debian package that fits your job and the release. And here's ones for Ubuntu 16.04, for 18.04. Here we go. Down near the bottom, you'll come to app images. This is Mike's preference for how to deliver the most to the people that need to know the least. And it works very nicely. There are a few steps you have to take in a terminal window, or a little line imitating a terminal window, which you can do in Ubuntu. Um, you can do all the steps with the mouse. Pardon? You can do all the steps with the mouse. Yeah. Uh, you can. Uh, but anyway, uh, he's saying get the package. And once you get the package, uh, you're going to put it somewhere on your computer that you can remember. I say downloads. And uh, then when you have it, uh, you're going to go over to it. No, no, no. First you make sure you have exit. <laughs> well, I was going to bring that up later, too. Oh, okay. Uh, but you're right. Um, and you download the package, and then all he's doing here, well, it takes more steps, uh, is he's going to where he saved it on his drive. And once he gets there, he's going to do a chmod, second line showing now up there. Just, just that short line, and that will give enough, uh, that will make the file available, and then you execute it with what's now the top line, 
And you don't have to write any of this down. It's just there, ready to go. So you download, put this on the screen on the left, a terminal window on the right, and just click and put it there. In Ubuntu, you have to know a secret. The secret is in the terminal window. Instead of doing a control V to put it there, you do a control shift V to put it there. So you copy with a control C, but when you're in the terminal window, you add a shift to the control V. Not, not a big deal. Uh, as Joe pointed out, now you're already loading it, and it's starting to load, and it comes back with an error message. Surprise. It's, it's a minor item. It's documented in here, and it's documented in the error message when it comes up. But XIF tools is needed in at least Ubuntu. I don't know about the others. And uh, it'll tell you, it'll nag you, or you can just install it ahead of time. And uh, scroll up path and the instructions are right there. When, when, I put, when I set up Ubuntu, it comes with the Ubuntu Software Center, which now is simply called Software. And uh, it's, it's the free online store. And uh, that's good for some things. It's not good for as much as it used to be, in my experience. And the things I want, like XIF tool, I go over to Synaptic Package Manager. I add that as well. And I just go to that, and I get, get it from there. Synaptic Package Manager is available in the Ubuntu Software Center. So I just, mm -hmm. I just load it. And here, when I set up logically in my launcher, why am I having it? Here we are. I find my cursor. Like a little bug running around. If I go down toward the bottom. Here's the so whoops. Dyslexia. Let me turn this around. Let it go. This is the software center here. And this is Synaptic Package Manager. Not to be confused with my favorite backup program, Back in Time, which looks a lot like it for the icon. But they light up and tell you what they are, very neatly, in Unity at least. So Synaptic is what I would load from the software center, and then I would use that to get that secret missing item. If you don't get it, it will remind you, and you'll go but get it and say, damn, I ought to remember that for next time, <laughs> uh, which you will do. <laughs> uh, so. That's it. That's how you install it, and it just installs. It comes up, and it's going to be looking for where <coughs> you keep the pictures you want to work on. Well, most of us keep them in slash pictures. That's where we keep them. So that's a logical default for that. I don't. I make trouble. I have a few different versions of Linux running on my computer uh, as separate bootable partitions. I don't want my pictures in any one of them. And I want to remember that my slash home is, I, I don't call that partition slash home. I could. I call it slash user data. As long as I just tell it slash user data, You've slash You've been dips. infected by Android. Pardon? You've been infected by Android. No, I just want to know which it is, whether it's in the partition or it isn't. And it won't tell me if it says slash home. I don't have that feedback that I want. I want feedback. I want, I want to help my client instead of puzzle over it. So um, it's just a, just a knack. But anyway, you can aim it to wherever you want. If you have to aim it somewhere else, you do. And now you're up and running. Let's look at photos. Um, that was just looking at what it would look like online when we go there. We'll go back to there a few times. Photox has been around a long time. I'm talking particularly about the one that just came out a couple of weeks ago, July 1st, and first time in a half year for release versions. So a um, bunch of changes. Um, we're already starting to tinker with the one that comes out January 1st. And I'll give you a couple of little looks at that. That's not what this is about. This is about what you can go home, download, and enjoy. And if you've been looking before, what's changed? When you're using a program, it would be nice if you have on-screen clues that clue you into where you're going. 
And Photox is somewhat different from a lot of other photography programs out there, particularly Photoshop and the GIMP, or what uh, non-Linux and Linux users tend to gravitate to. And they're not all the same. Um, so the conversion between them becomes puzzling. Some of the best critiques of Photox were complaining about the entry level confusion, just be, not because anything is difficult, but because it's different. And there have been some changes this time because of that feedback earlier. And I am running now with a big, wide, gray background, extra column, a uh, menu full of Photox that got loaded. And I would normally run it only with icons. Again, I want more width if I can have it. But if I'm showing you things, it'd be nice to have the prompts, the clues, the text. So a button click difference, and I've got it with text or narrower. You could have just the text and no icons, whatever you prefer. So uh, I'm showing it the big way, all the stuff showing. And you've got a lot of good clues. Uh, file view. This is a gallery view that we're in right now. A file view would say, pick one. I can click any one. And there it is. I've got a file view of that particular image file. I can do it on the keyboard just as easily, F and G, instead of a file view and a gallery view. So G gets me back to gallery, F to file. And I can move around, scroll, and just naturally move to where I want. Or I can do really nifty, smart searches all kinds of ways to suck things out from this huge collection. Um, and uh, by the way, this was just last Friday, a week, less than a week ago. Um, so um, lots of images, lots of stuff to do, and there's further help when you need it. In general, any place you're in doing an operation of Photox, hit the F1 key, and your web browser will come up and show you the instructions in the giant user guide, written in good English with good illustrations, um, and it'll take you right to that place in the guide where you're working now. Very nice. Uh, not good enough for you, there's more help online beyond that. There's a lot of good prompts between the two, right while your tool is open, whatever you're doing. So we'll try some. Uh, but before we do, I thought I'd take you on a trip as to what we try. And for that, I wanted to go find in 2016, which might be here and there. Time out. Yes, 2016, but October. I'm heading for June. And oh, I also want to introduce our granddaughter who's with us tonight, Claire. And uh, Claire uh, is up here and over there, and she's a super artist. So she's also working this summer as a photographer, so all of this is coming together. I'm the opposite of an artist. I'm kind of a techie, and I go to a meeting once a month that drags me into the art side of photography. I go kicking and screaming, but I really learn, so uh, the, the mix is significant. Um, I'm still looking for my... 2015, I overshot. I do this a little differently normally. I'm right about where I want to be. I'm very close. That's, that's Jill teaching Claire, and you'll never guess what she's learning. Uh, Jill says knitting's kind of like programming. And when I discovered Jacquard looms, I discovered <laughs> the, she ain't kidding. <laughs> uh, I'm going a little further here. Here we come. Here we come now. Um, I don't want this. This is this is one of my favorites. This is a picture I like. Uh, and uh, by the way, kind of like when we were coming here. But this is in Manhattan. And uh, I don't want that. I want to look at the original. I want to look at the source for these finished up things because we're going to talk about how you get from one to another. So I just hit G for gallery, and the one right ahead of it is its source. Not quite as nice, is it? It's got all the information for doing the good one and more. That's what's important to remember. Little pocket camera, 8 bits, G 
JPEG, not raw, not what they tell you down at the photo store, and it's got everything you need. So, what's wrong with it? Well, first of all, perspective, the buildings are kind of leaning in on each other because I'm aiming upward. Maybe not a problem, maybe, maybe the fact you want, maybe not, but something to think about, you might want to adjust it. Why is it so dark? It's not because the camera made a mistake. It's because the top is so bright. It averaged between the super bright and the super dark. And the part I want to see is much too dark as a result. Anything else wrong with it? Well, we could certainly crop it a little nicer. It's not shaped for my widescreen or that widescreen. Uh, there's things you might want to do to it just to make it a cleaner version of what you took, what you saw. So here we've corrected for that parallax. We've cropped it to the part we want. There was a lot at the bottom. There was car dashboard and stuff like that. I kept it narrow, not widescreen. For this example, we'll see others. But this is a standard 4 by 3 ratio. Good for framing. 2 foot by 3 foot on the wall, that sort of stuff. And um, it did some interesting things beyond that that you can't see until you've worked in more detail. If I make it brighter, some parts get too bright. There's ways I can lift the darkest part by expanding that section of the uh, brightness spectrum, if you will, uh, while I don't expand all the rest of it. And Photox knows how to do that in several very clever ways. This is how you suck in the equivalent of extra color depth. It's, it's a cheat, but we have a lot of pixels to play with and we know how to play with them. So. Uh, that's just an example of what you might want to do for a plain, straight photo. Still driving in Manhattan, and I told you I take the pictures, and then we talk. And here I've come to a picture that I thought also looked promising. It's not that good, but it looks promising. It has some nice elements in it I could maybe do something nice with. Take my cursor out of the way. So. Instead of showing you how, I'm going to show you where we're going. And we'll go back and see how we got there. It would be more interesting that way. Maybe I'm right. So here is, uh, is that the beginning of it? Yeah, that's the first, that's the original. And by the way, it's uh, 4,600 pixels wide. My display is 1,366 wide, a lot smaller. And, uh, maybe a third the width. So I can play with one ninth as many pixels if I size at the beginning. Doesn't matter one way or the other if I know where I'm going and it's going to be that small. So I would tend to resize early on. And then I'd go in and I'd play the same games we were talking about for the other one. And I'd come out with a much more interesting to me photograph from the original. Just the concept. You want to get somewhere from somewhere else. Where do you want to get? That's one of the big questions. That's, that's where you come in. But wouldn't it be nice if I could do other things to it after I just made an accurate photograph? So that's an example of something else I could do to it. This is interesting. I told you how we're fighting for extra color depth. We want those 10 bits worth instead of 8 bits worth. <coughs> and we fight and fight. But look what nice things you get when you go to three bits of color depth. That's what you're looking at here. And I can pick my number and play with it, go back and forth, in and out, see what I like. I don't have much color. And the result can be very interesting. All the rules break when you start looking for ways to break them nicely. What happened here? It's the same photograph. Can anyone see the photograph in this? It's a yin-yang interpretation of that photograph. And I didn't like it that much. But like the first one, I said, in it, in it, maybe there's something I will like. And I went in fishing. Where will I go fishing? I picked in, I think, around here somewhere, if I remember. Maybe I'll be right. I said, let's go take a look inside. And I think when I came to about here, I said, 
I think I've almost got it. That's kind of interesting. That's more simplified to where your brain can parse it into something weird, but not totally alien. And what would happen if I took that? I came out with that as my final version. There's a road stripe printing up the upper right. I really like the way the uh, cable adjusters on the uh, cable tensioners are showing up in there. There's a lot, I would love the car going uphill. Um, maybe you don't. The point is you can take one photograph in a lot of directions, and Photox is designed to take you there in a lot of directions. Or, or depending upon how perverted you are, uh, the uh, bridge tower can, you can almost see that as a uh, phallic image. <laughs> well, yes, of course you can. Um, you can see anything as a phallic yeah. image. Yeah. Yeah. What, is the, what is the Gilbert and Sullivan song we just saw? I am the fairy uh, model of a... Modern me. Well, anyway, it, it, it rhymed genius with genius, and I really I, like that. <laughs> a very stable genius, that's it. Very model of a very stable genius. So, uh, so you see, our president has brought you some things of value after all. <laughs> Not enough. Uh, so that's a concept. Um, yes, uh, there ought to be some potion you can buy for that. Um, and here's another example like it. Uh, kind of muddy, kind of almost where it might get better, and straightforward processing. So that's about all I wanted to say for what you might want to do with photographs, but it's quite a bit, really. There's a lot of different variations, thousands of them, on these sorts of tricks, other tricks like them, and some tricks to come for the next round as well that build on them. But let's look at some of these. I introduce you to the first main sections of the menu, file view and gallery. I don't run world maps because my little camera doesn't put down GPS coordinates. But if it did, every photograph would know where it was. And on some better cameras, which way it was pointing. Compass. But you can also uh, manually map to locations. Oh yes, you can, you can put this in after the fact in many ways. I just don't. My life simplifies in many corners so I can lean in more than the ones I want to lean in on. Like you. Uh, and when mine is automatic, I'll take it. But I can bring up a world map, zoom in, pick photographs within 47 miles of this spot, whatever, and it'll bring up all my photos from those 43,000 that correlate. I'm not doing it. Uh, net maps, you can go online and do the same trick. Um, but uh, favorites, I've got a hell of a lot of tools here. If I were an artist painting with a palette, I'd pick the colors I'm working with and put them right on the palette in my hand where I can just reach <coughs> instead of having to go over, look on the shelf wherever and find the next one. And similarly, in favorites, you could put some of the tools you want to work with. That's not my list. I don't use favorites because I'm busy showing people how, and this is the opposite. This isn't showing them what the menu does. Uh, but bottom near the center, there's one that slipped over from Mike Cornelison. He's from Texas, he's worked in Boston, but he lives in Munich. So um, I see a little German slipped in on one of them. Um, again, this is a couple of weeks old for the version I'm showing. Has, but, I'm about to tell them about that one when I get home. I noticed it this morning, but I've been busy. So, um, so that's favorites. Uh, it's yours for the tools you reach for the most in the order, in the sequence you reach for them the most. Uh, save. Save is really pretty simple. You've made something. It's a lot smaller than the original. You've got it. And it will either save it as your first edited version and automatically put right ahead of the .jpg or the .png or the .what have you 
right ahead of that extension, it'll put dot V for version, and then two digits up to 99 for any one image. <coughs> so you'll start with dot V01. But if you have a dot V07 in there, it'll make a dot V08 for, for the one you're adding when you do a save. But maybe you don't want that. Maybe you just improve dot V02 so you can save as the same file also. And you can make your own arrangement if you want to do something custom. So various kinds of save to keep the management making sense later. Previous next just does what the gallery does. Left and right arrow do the same thing. It steps back to the prior image or forward to the next image in whatever way you have them selected and sorted while you're working. Um, um, and down a little from there, here's another one that looks a little like it, but the arrows are curvy. And that one is undo and redo. Every time you do a step developing an image, you can say done when you're finished with a step. And that makes a little mark, and this will step back and forth through the steps. Did I really like this better than the one before, or the one three before? Do I want to step back, look, and then step forward again? Keep going. You can always back and forth that way while you're developing one. In between them, I'm, I put them together because they're kind of similar in people's minds. Metadata. Metadata has all kinds of information. It rides along with the image, everything from the file name uh, to information like how many stars I want to give this image from one to five based on how much I value it. Might be how good it is, but it might be that it's the best picture you have of your grandmother, and that's real valuable, even though it's a crummy picture. So the stars are a personal way of ranking. I can select on those later. Okay. And I, yep. One of the neat things, I think, is that when you edit things with Photox, it puts the steps in it as part of the meta metadata so that you can see what you did to that. That's right. The metadata has your audit trail on what you did to edit it. Damn, I want to do what I did last week on that, but what was it? Well, look in the metadata, and it'll tell you what was it. Very nice, thank you. Um, so the metadata has a lot of stuff. Um, and you can view lots of it. Uh, it'll include all the camera information, like what F number and yeah. shutter speed and all that. All the regular stuff. All this information is going into standard format. You don't have to stay in Photox. The stars may not be understood by another program you're running, but it won't interfere with what that program is doing. Your images don't become Photox images. They become images that are just a little smarter under Photox. But oh, and by the way, if you're taking pictures with your phone, most of them have know where you are, and that information goes with the metadata. Sure. So it's you might want to keep it, or you might not want to. Right. It might squeal on you. Who knows? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the standard problem with computers, uh, especially nowadays. So metadata has just tons of stuff, including uh, search at the bottom, which is a very nice, complex search. Uh, if you like searching online, you like searching in your photos with this. Once you've added stars to your photos, you of course have dates on your photos, you might have added places, or your camera might have added places on your photos. Um, tags. You might want to add tags. Photox comes with a bunch of tags preset, but they're totally customizable. You can add as many tags as you want. You want to put one in for grandma, or for favorite PCs, or anything else. Uh, just click. Once you've got the tag, you click, and it's attached to the photo, and you can search on tags. When you do searches, you can do searches for combinations set as and or as or. So you might want ones that are grandma with my favorite PC, or just the ones that are either grandma or my PC. You can do it either way. Very complicated, 
elegant searches grow very quickly out of that. And you can get what you want if you get around to tagging your images. Don't tag everything, just the ones you edit. It's easy to do, uh, but you have to do it. Uh, what else is in here? View meta, view all meta, including lots of boring details about the camera detail. Uh, and edit metadata is the important one for what you're going to do. Uh, edit any meta lets you go into that huge collection of stuff, including changing the camera name, all kinds of awful things. But it's in there. And uh, captions. Captions is straightforward. I've got them now, up top. This one didn't have much information attached to it. I'll leave it on and see ones to do. Uh, lots of stuff. So that's metadata. We're going down the list. Areas. I'm not going to go into areas if we had two talks on two successive months. I might do areas in both of them. And anything I'm doing on the photo, I can do on a part of the photo. Except give it a file name. Uh, there must be a few things I can't do. But in general, if I'm playing with brightness, contrast, all the new, normal things, I can do it on a part. I can draw a line around the part I'm talking about. I can let the computer find the line by contrast of brightness, by contrast of color, etc., etc. I've got a bunch of ways. I can have me or the computer or the two of us working together quick outline what I want. And there's some nice examples on Mike's Photox home site. And one of them for select area has his mother-in-law not only walking on the water, but standing right at the edge of a whirlpool. <laughs> so uh, I'm not sure if this is a compliment or not, but uh, it's an impressive demonstration. And we have some nice ones too, including uh, Claire, Jill, me, and a friend uh, standing about this deep in a glacial fjord with the glacier coming down into the water we're standing in. It's very beautiful and it was taken on a very hot street in Spain. So you can do wonderful things with selecting areas and working on them. Enough said for now about it. It's advanced when you hit it, when you've got some time and you want to really have fun. Wonderful stuff. And all those photos of Trump sitting on Putin's knee and being operated like a ventriloquist dummy, that's this sort of tool at work. You've been seeing a lot of those lately. Uh, making the rounds. Uh, undo, redo, you know about. Edit. Edit used to be one. And that gave people a lot of trouble because Photox has a lot of editing tools. Too many. People start and they come in and they say, where's the tool I used to use? Where do I find brightness in this? Where do I find this and that? So edit is now separated into edit one and edit two. Notice edit one for the icon has a blunt hammer. And edit two has a magic wand. So all the fancy new stuff that you don't want to know about yet, you just want to get your damn picture fixed the way you used to. That's all in the hammer section. You'll find all the regular stuff, including some fancy tools, but ones you'd expect to find in most programs. Edit two gets fancier. Uh, warp. Um, that swirled around bridge I showed you, that's one kind of many kinds of warp. The uh, buildings that straightened up and flew vertical, that's another kind of warp. Warping is bending the image one way or another. And two of the three new tools we'll be already working on for next year uh, are coming in the warp section. Uh, effects. The warp, by the way, has a, a watch, a clock face. Warps. Um, warp in time. Effects. Again, magic. A wizard's hat for effects. There's a lot of effects. And uh, some of them are neat. And we'll talk about some of those later, too. Uh, combine. One of the new effects, 
comes from another troublemaker in this room for Photox. He's a known troublemaker, his name is Bill Ricker, and I want you to know that of the three first new tools going into next year's, they all came from Boston. I started it, Bill saw what I said, and he picked up with another one he liked, and then in the conversation, Bill looked at the one I'd sent in and said, that's sort of kind of like, can we do this too? And they're all up and running in the draft already. Uh, Monday last week, I went to my favorite artsy-fartsy photo meeting, New England Light Painters. Wonderful. And there, I saw an effect I loved. Um, next morning, I wrote to Mike. I said, I saw this. It's really neat. We've got a few things a little like it. I have a feeling you've done most of the programming for this already. And sliding it together with a different algorithm in the middle might do it. Uh, I went to the FOSS meeting we run in Natick once a month, last Thursday. I sent it Tuesday morning. By the time I came home from my meeting, he had it up and running. <laughs> Beautiful. That got Bill going. And Bill came up with one, too. Um, and then we came up with a third one, kind of like the one I sent, but different, which you might know about already, but I did not. I'd seen it, but I'd never paid much attention. It's called Tiny Worlds. Anybody know what I said? Little, little bitty Planets. earth or what have you, with maybe some big skyscrapers standing out up on it, like they're you know, half the size of the earth itself. Very strange looking stuff, but not that different from that twist effect. And the twist effect had something else hiding under it, I did first, to make it a little more awkward not as computer looking. If you followed the curves, some of them didn't follow the smooth twist. And that's because first I made the picture into a sphere of fisheye view of it. And then I took the fisheye view and I distorted it from a sphere back toward a rectangle, but only toward it. One end is rectangle, one end is sphere, and I skidded as far as I wanted to just make four corners sort of awkward from the spherical projection. And it came out more interesting because of it. Um, so trick after trick. Um, I'll show you those. Onward down the list, though, because we're almost done. The effects. Combine is Bill's trick that he just added. Bill took one photograph, and he made two copies of it, exactly the same photograph. One copy he processed in a direction that enhanced the photo information. The other copy he took the exact opposite direction. He turned it into a black ink sketch on white, very much white, a little bit of black, no color. And then he combined the two. So the one building he wanted to emphasize just slammed out against the sketched background of everything else in the neighborhood incredibly brilliant way to show something you're trying to highlight. Uh, we'll look at it. So that's, that's using normal, layers. That's a fairly normal technique in Photoshop. Uh, we didn't have a way to do it in this program. I didn't want to go back to the GIMP for this. So Mike stuck it in there. Yeah. And it turned out a lot of the pieces are already there. The ability to work with a wonderful program and with the hotshot developer of the program is golden. A lot of you already know that. You are the developer or you work with the developer. And this is one of those. Mike listens to good input and the feedback time may be astonishing. <laughs> uh, so um, so I'll, I'll look at an example of each of those shortly. But the point is we're now looking at combines. There's a lot of ways you can combine different photos, or the same photo, HDR, high dynamic range. Uh, let's say you take three copies of the same picture. You're on a tripod. You're looking exactly the same way. But you adjust for the dark section. You adjust for the brightest section, etc. And then later you combine them. And now you have more than eight uh, depths of color. 
because you're in more than one exposure and combining them. There's a lot of ways to cheat with a computer, and there's a whole bunch of them where you combine different images, or as Bill did, cheat by combining the same in image, edit it differently. Same kind of game, they're all combines of one kind and another. There's a lot of them. Oh, one of the beauties of that is just take three of the same picture, exactly the same way, and cancel the noise. It's not the same noise in all three. The rest of it is the same in all three. Aren't computers fun? Uh, so, uh, process. Uh, why don't I do a process? I will, uh, where am I now? I'm in Dick's favorites. Uh, do a search. There's a lot of processes to uh, uh, batch convert. Uh, I want to select 15 pictures from the ones I took in the last month, send them to somebody. I just click on them. Each one, I have a bunch of things I can do when I click on it. I probably pick copy to cache. I can copy the clipboard, I can copy the cache, I can copy the desktop, etc., etc. Uh, but cache is nice because after I clicked all 15, I haven't stacked up all the images like I would if I clipboard it. I just found pointers to each one, so it's taking up no space in memory. And now I set up a letter, perhaps, uh, with uh, attachments to it. And I just say, dump the cache here. Or I set up an, a new album for my slideshows, and I say, Fill this one with cash. Whatever's in cash, put it here. They're all there. And then I can drag them back and forth in the order I really want them. I can open it up if it's a message and put captions in between or paragraphs of discussion or whatever. Very nice. Batch upright. I've got a thousand pictures I just brought in from somewhere else, and some of them are sitting sideways. It just riffles through and puts them all upright. Um, Etc. Etc. Lots of stuff. Batch raw. I can bring in. I'm not going to work with raw images, but I can bring in raw images and work with them from that SLR camera. Of course, why not? Uh, and uh, so that's. Oh, but but I was getting to the bottom of process. The last one on the list is search, and I thought I'd do at least one of those. And. We have lots of stuff. There's the stars up here. Two, stars range two to five. This is a search I use normally for what I call Dick's favorites. This is my 2300 sum at the moment pictures out of the many, many. And um, I can search on all with the current set only. I can match images into a new set. I can remove images. Removing is important. I might want to do a search for something I want to get rid of might be duplicate images, things like that. Um, so um, I can set a date range, including time. Uh, I can uh, uh, search that dot V is automatically going to get me only images I've edited, not originals, because remember the dot V and two digits is what gets added to every edited one in Photos. Uh, and, uh, I can search for locations, actual places around the world. I can search for, uh, uh, no, I think that's uh, going to a particular folder, sorry. I find that confusing, actually. On the right, I told you to search for all or any. There's little bullets you can hit for any one of the categories, whether it wants to be blue and sky, or blue or sky. It'll pick either and put them in, or it has to be ones that align for both. You click that on the right. And there's tags. Here's a list of tags. It's a partial list of tags. Uh, you add to it. Um, now, this one isn't the original one. It's got some extra in it, but it's only partial. It's not yet mine, because I got it a couple of weeks ago and have stuff to. Uh, I thought I'd updated it, but I haven't, so I have to go back and pick up some. Um, and uh, you can search text. Uh, comments you were added to the file. Uh, this was the last picture of Aunt Betty, and uh, you can look for 
onto a blast or whatever you want in there. Uh, so et cetera, et cetera, you can do a search. My standard search to go through 43,000 and pick up the ones that have those capabilities will take, the, it's already prepared for that, it'll take this long. One, two, three, whack, there's the answer. It's got 2,324, okay? And when I say, okay, it did it. Just that fast. And I say, okay, and there's the set. The set is not sorted the way I want. Depending on what I want, I can set the sort very quickly. And uh, photo date time. And now they're sort of starting at the beginning, way back when. Uh, where was it here? I'm not sure. Uh, way back when. Uh, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to rush to, I mean, the, the speed of these things is very, very fast on almost all operations. You can always find an operation that isn't if you work hard enough, but it takes work. Here we go. Um, you saw my twisties. This is a different kind of twisty. Uh, I called Mike last week, Tuesday morning, and by Thursday afternoon he had this sitting in my inbox. And uh, this one is called, can anyone who doesn't know look at it and tell me what it might be called? What did it do? Figure eight. Figure eight? Linear no. to polar coordinate transformation. Oh, no. what's going on? The linear to polar coordinate transformation. This is called inside out. Uh -huh. It's a linear polar the, that, uh, Cartesian to polar coordinate. And, and that is what I asked for when I heard they were working on this. And, and I, I bought into this Monday, Monday night a week ago, and uh, I loved it. This is. This isn't what I bumped into. This is Mike's interpretation of it after I wrote him what it was about. And I couldn't find a photo to send him yet. So he just went for my verbal. But basically, you set a center point, a, a focal point, let me call it, of your choice in the image. And uh, you can also set limits within the image. You can set a grid, a box within that box. Uh, and then, Every pixel in the image is on its own radial line from the focal point, right? The mathematics is simple. You take its distance from the outside edge of that box, you said, and you move that pixel to that distance from the focal point on the same radial line for every pixel in the picture. And that's what you get. If it's almost all the way to the edge, it's going to be almost all the way to the center on that same radial line. All the way around, all the way in and out. That's what you get. Is it interesting? Mike said, it doesn't look that interesting to me yet. It's interesting conceptually, but artistically, eh. I said, maybe it didn't look yet. <laughs> maybe it didn't look hard enough yet. I think it's interesting. I think we've got a wonderful new tool to start adding to other tools and play with. Can't have it yet. Wait till January. Or get in on the beta testing. Mike said, I could take a Van Gogh. And he said, I've got a Picassoizer. <laughs> I'd say it's more an Escherizer. And I, I said, um, uh, I said, no, you don't. What you have is a, Picasso, a Picassification program. That's what I said. Um, and indeed it is. So basically, this is you can now do everything in GIMP that you would want to do, but do it here? Well, it depends what you want to do. It is not complete yet and will never be. We keep adding things every time we think we've got what we want. The, the point here is that it's uh, an intentional interface as opposed to an extensional interface. In Photoshop or GIMP, um, you have to decide how you're going to get the effect you want. Here, 
the, the effects or what are in the menu. So it's like if you only had the plug, you only had the plugins in GIMP or Photoshop and didn't have all the fiddly little tools. Yeah. Um, so it's basically a lot more efficient for large collections of images. It's a lot, a lot more efficient if you aren't a, or you don't want to be a graphics programmer. Here comes the next step that built from that step, because Bill made a comment about what I was talking to Mike about, and said, kind of like tiny planets, isn't it? And I said, tiny planets? And Mike said, tiny planets? <laughs> and Mike said, can you give me an example? And before anything else happened, I just went online and found a million kids' cartoons and things of that sort with that name. And then I hit the stuff with the GIMP and for Photoshop. And it turns out there's a lot of add-ons to do this. Oh, I left out an interesting one. One of the things you can add to Photox is plugins from the GIMP and from Photoshop. More fun coming. Mike took this as his attempt, built on what Bill and I were telling him about tiny planets, and uh, this is Bryce Canyon. You say that Photox running on Linux can use uh, Photoshop plugins from Windows? No, he wrote his own code for doing oh. it. Uh, but we, it was out there already for those. That's how come Bill knew about it. It's been out there. I just had, I'd seen a couple, but I never, never really registered with me. When I saw them, I said, "Oh yeah, I recognize those," but I'd never done anything. When Photox says. It has a plug-in. It's an ability to launch a command line on a you know, file here and then bring the image back in. So you have already seen photos do the twist. You already said I can show you a simple one with a spheroid, uh, the fisheye view. I can do that. Uh, but here's that next step that's already cooking now, which is tiny planets. That's what it turned into. That's sort of the concept. These are first cuts. These are original drafts of things that'll be offering you, I think, a lot of flexibility on the next release. Uh, we just started to get up and running. So it's a lovely package to play with, either as a user, a developer, or a nagger from the side, a creative nagger, <laughs> which I see us as doing very nicely and getting wonderful feedback from it. And it turns out Boston is now a major uh, player in this German program from a Texan. <laughs> uh, if you'd like me to show you any particular operation, I can. Um, I think the thing to emphasize is just that in general you have help nearby at several levels while you're doing it. And uh, you really have to know what the menu means. This new redesigned menu is significantly different. I thought it was an affront because I knew the other one. <laughs> you too? Uh, but that's because we were there. For people coming in, I have no question it's going to take away a lot of that initial hesitation, awkwardness, frustration as you're trying to figure out where the hell is yeah. so I like it. I like the setup. And again, you can take the words away and make it smaller when you don't need them. Back and forth, any time. Quick question on rotate with JPEGs. Is that lossless or lossy? Let's just do it again. On rotate? Uh, when I rotate picture, something? When you rotate something, is that a lossless rotation? Or so, uh, no. As long as, uh, as long as it's a multiple of 90 degrees, it, it may very well be lossless. Anything else, and it's definitely lossy. And, of course, JPEGs are somewhat lossy. Yeah, it, no, it, it offers, are lossy. Elliot's right that the 90 degree increments are a special case. Which is okay. Oh, they're, they're, they're lossless. Let's, let's do some JPEG issue. Oh, but yeah, we, Let me start with this. Often, often, often JPEG is simply a, oh, it changes one little tag in the file, and it's simply, oh, instead of displaying it 
nor operate. I flip it after I display it. That's, uh, let's do no, more programs on it. Yeah. Let's do one a bunch of ways. Um, it's going to be in edit one because you expect to have it. Mm -hmm. So we go to edit one and click. And in edit one, we have trim rotate right at the top. That's a big package of stuff. And it's one the one we're looking for. Down to from it, retouch is also a big package of stuff. It's going to hold brightness and contrast and stuff like that. Uh, although I start with trim rotate normally. Uh, so I'll go into this picture. Actually, let me not, because this is something he sent me after he processed it. Let's go to an original instead. Won't take longer, and it's a fairer test. It's, it's larger, and it's, so it'll take longer, and it's more like real, not already made beautiful. Uh, so where am I? Who am I? G for G for Gal, thank you. See, everyone knows already. I have already. been paying attention. And, uh, so, uh, I, I missed one. Ha, uh, ha, this time, it's not in the right place. Good. Bill, I was looking for this. This is what Bill did, his trick for next year. How do you take a photograph and emphasize what you want in it this well? Isn't that neat? What a nice technique cool. for just this emphasizing what you want. And if, if you know the MBTA, this is the Field Family Mansion at Fields Corner. Mm -hmm. It was shoved back a hundred feet by lifting it up off the foundation in order to make way for the office block, a retail block. And all the windows were bricked up and it's a warehouse now. But there were seam lines where the bricks filled in the windows. Um, so I've colored the windows back in window color. And he didn't just cheat on the background. The foreground, the bricks are much more emphasized than they were in the original photo. Went in a different direction. So it's really, it's enhanced both ways to emphasize the part that's wanted. A beautiful example and a tool that he had elsewhere but not in Photox. In Photox he had it. But with a lot of steps. Well, I, well, I, and there was a, the, the right step was available, but it assumed you were layering sna snaps of almost exactly the same picture, maybe from a tripod, and you were going to paint out the person that was walking across the room or something. And I didn't want to go through full alignment on images that were already perfectly aligned because the auto alignment could be fooled um, by these two images. So let's pick on Bill and do the rotate. Um, and then <laughs> I'm going to bring sure. up the rotate. My picture's grown when I do it, so pick on yours. Um, this takes a little bit to bring up. It's bringing up a lot of tools. I think I could. I think it's coming. That's much slower than it should be. Um, try again. Fifteen. Sort of response. Final view. But it's not a memory issue. It's me. Oh, oh, oh. It's stupidity set, set, setting in. Uh, edit one, trim rotate. I bet that goes faster. There we go. Okay. And um, grid or not, sizing of the grid up to you. This is what I've set for my default grid that I like. And I'm going to look for vertical lines, and I want to align to them. Or a horizontal water line on a lake or an ocean, I want to align to that. So this is the grid I want, fairly close together. Other people will do something different. I can set 4 by 3, 16 by 9, very common ratios, or anything else you want, or nothing. You just slide it to the shape you want without encumbering it with a preset. I can rotate 90 degrees, 180 degrees, and it'll snap pretty fast to there. I can set a degree setting 46 at 0.5 degrees, and it'll go to there. But it takes a little more work to get there. And uh, I can just pick it up and drag the right edge to go to what I want to just align to the grid. So let's say I want the roof to come out level which I certainly don't in this image. But for an example, 
I just go to the right edge and tap and drag until it aligns where I want. I need more finger. There I go. I'd say maybe there is what I want for that job. Pretty responsive. Small computer, not a hot shot computer. Nice part program. Of, part of the way it gets that responsiveness is. I can carefully put it back to the beginning, or I can hit cancel. It, it's cheating. It's uh, only processing the, the preview, and I'll do the whole megapixel version when, when you play the bottom. Mike cheats very well. If there's a way to get an advantage, he'll go for it. And there's a lot of, as some of you know, there's a lot of techie information out there as to what are the best algorithms for this or for that. He's gotten feedback that I've participated in when people say, that's, that's not the right way to do this. He says, actually, that way was pioneered at MITRE back in so-and-so, and, -so, and <laughs> it's still the fastest one for this operation. Uh, so he might come from a different direction than a lot of other programs do, but it goes in a good, effective direction. It's my experience with it. And if it doesn't, a little clue as to what might be done differently will have them often doing it differently. Uh, it is open source. Mike is the only significant program <coughs> on the job. People send in code and ideas, <coughs> but uh, if Mike needs replacing, the source code will be very valuable. And of course, it's out there where it can con continue. Uh, uh, so far, it looks just great. We love it, and that's why I volunteered for it. It's the one I think I want to give most of my time to. Because I get the most back. Yes. That's simple. Uh, <coughs> I can demonstrate anything else you want. Of there's a zillion tools in there. Uh, but I really recommend you try out the app image and uh, listen to what Joe reminded you about. You will need XIF tool. Uh, I think it's the Perl version for my Ubuntu. And you know, I just typed in uh, Synaptic Package Manager. I just did a search for XIF tool gave me three choices, and one that wanted was obvious when it was. Um, and it just came in, and then I did the install, and it just worked very quickly. And it prompts you through as you go. What you do want to do is figure out what pictures you do want to work on, and what pictures you don't want to work on. And you can set up one or more directories to do it. I just use slash pictures, and I'm take them all, uh, but you could have some subset that you know you never want to edit. You just keep them anyway for some documentary reason, and you can keep them in a part you don't go to. Simple uh, folder separation, if you want that. I the add, reason, pardon? The reason is that the first time you do it, Photox sets up an index and thumbnails, and it can take quite a long time to do that. Oh yes, when you well, first it's running a lot faster than you used to. It won't start until well, you tell it to start. Last year it started, and you wondered when it was going to stop. And for forty-three thousand images, it didn't take a whole dinner time, but it made sense to do it at dinner time. It took a long. It took more than ten minutes. Yeah. To do forty-three thousand from scratch. That's not um, so. Uh, now there's a little button. When you say go, it goes. Until you say go, it doesn't sandbag you. Um, uh, et cetera, et cetera. That, that's right. At the start, if you have a set like I have, you set three times the set I have. Uh, prepare totally your 